Um, so hopefully hoping uh, to stay with the theme, I will try to give you my points of view today about a different perspective issue like on addiction. And I would really like to start with the choices that we are making. I really believe that we all obviously make choices. Life is all about making choices. And, you know, simply this could be choosing our careers, our friends, our partners. And sometimes, I guess we might be lucky to make the good choices, but sometimes the choices that we make might be bad, might be the wrong choices. But just because those choices were not the good ones, does that make us bad or abnormal in any ways? Or similarly, when we think about it, we all act in a maladaptive way sometimes. Although we want to be adaptive, we're not always adaptive. And maybe, again, a simple example there might be sometimes when we face a problem, some of us uh, do not necessarily try to find the ways, the perfect ways to solve this problem, but we just avoid it. We pretend like the problem doesn't exist. And is this adaptive? No, it's not. It's what we call in psychology a maladaptive behavior. Hence, we all do it. Still, it's a choice that we are making. And when we think about it like that, as I said, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, we have a disorder, we are making bad choices. And possibly, again, we might all be aware, addiction, universally, addiction is on the rise, all sorts of different addictions. But specifically, this is one of the aspects of it that I'm interested in. When we look at individualistic versus collectivist cultures, we see that addiction is a more of a problem in individualistic cultures. And research shows us that possibly one of the reasons for that might be because people in individualistic cultures tend to feel lonelier and also perceive less support. And research consistently shows that maybe one of the explanations there is that people in individualistic cultures feel hopelessness. And this hopelessness basically tends to predict substance use. And when we look at collectivist cultures, we see that that usually is uh, not the case. People do not feel hopeless, hence we see uh, less rates of addiction. So basically, if addiction was a disease, my question would be, why does it matter what type of culture we live in? So it should be something else. But saying that, of course, in the field of addiction still, the most prominent view is that addiction is a disease. It's a brain disease. And the fact that they, uh, the supporters of this model basically argue that this is the only way to prevent blaming or punishing addicts, to remove the stigma around addiction. Again, the supporters of the disease model would argue that this is the only way to get funding for addiction and offer possible treatments for addiction. But again, I think differently here. Just because their research argues that the brain of the addict is malfunctioning, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a disease. So hopefully this would uh, be what I will try to show you. Let's think about, if you like, some real diseases for a minute. When you think about like diabetes or cancer, in those illnesses, physical illnesses, you cannot simply choose to stop the undesirable symptoms. You just can't. They're undesirable, but you cannot choose to stop them. But when we look at the field of addiction, we see that sometimes people actually are able to stop. So if this was like any other physical disease, how would that be possible? And when we look at some research, again, we see that, for example, when you offer people something that is meaningful and rewarding for them, then they might actually decide to stop drinking or using. For some people, which I have also witnessed by myself when I used to live in London, when you offer some homeless alcohol addict a free place to live, which is a rewarding experience, they then decide to actually, maybe it's time for me to change this behavior. And they're able to do that. So that's why we cannot think of addiction just like any other uh, physical disease, like the supporters of the disease model basically are arguing. Again, let's think about an alcohol addict. Someone who, because of their alcohol addiction problem, now 
is not able to pay their bills anymore. Maybe they're about to lose their job. Maybe they're about to lose their family. If this person decides that actually it might be time for change, we know that this person will have different motives in his life. Of course, he is going to urge to drink. He will have these urges for alcohol. But the minute he starts thinking, possibly, you know, if I don't drink, then this will get my family back. This way I'm not going to lose my job. We see that the urges would be in competition with this type of motives. And similarly, research consistently actually shows us that by the age of 30, most addicts stop, whether that's alcohol or heroin or any other behavioral addiction. Most addicts stop by the age of 30. And when we look at what happens at the age of 30, this is usually the time that you start a family, you start to have maybe a stable job. So this means that these type of motivations might actually help people in their decision to stop. So therefore, going back to my point, my argument here would be that this is, it's not right to call this just a disease like any other disease. And I think maybe here, you know, this talk wouldn't be one without mentioning some, of course, very famous experiments, which show us that when we sometimes change our environment, then we also make different choices. Two of the most famous examples here would be the Rudd Park experiment and the Vietnam War. Starting with the Rudd Park experiment, this was a very famous experiment, which was conducted in 1970s by Alexander and his colleagues. And basically, initially, they decided to put a rat in an isolated cage by himself. And in that cage, they also included two types of water. One was pure water. The other one was morphine-laced water. And they have consistently observed that these rats would end up preferring choosing the morphine-laced water and eventually die. So Alexander and his colleagues basically made the conclusion that probably this rat was lonely and bored. So then they did a second experiment. This time, as you can see there, they built what they called a rat park. So in rat park, this was a fun place to be. So rat was not alone anymore. He had his friends around him. And also in the rat park, there were plenty of opportunities to play around. So the same conditions, both the plain water and the morphine lace water. And what did the rats choose? They chose the water. They did not want to die in this environment. And then in the third follow-up experiment, this time Alexander went a step further. And this time they took some rats, similarly like the first time, put them in an isolated cage, and on purpose drugged them for 57 days until these rats became heavily addicted to morphine. And then this time he took the same rat and then placed them in the rat park. And what happened? Despite having what we call withdrawal symptoms, the rats actually decided to choose the water. So they did not go for the morphine anymore. So I really believe this is an indication that this drug addiction is not a disease. It also has something to do with what is going on in our environment. As I believe, as I said, I think the second good example here is the Vietnam War. This is very obvious from the research that when America sent his soldiers to Vietnam, 20% of them became addicted to heroin during their stay in Vietnam. And of course, after a while, these soldiers had to go back home. So what happened when they get back home? Only about 5% of them were addicted and needed rehabilitation. And overall, 95% of them had no addiction problems. So if addiction was a disease that you get and it's impossible to get rid of, how could these people stay heroin free when they went back home, possibly, you know, to their home, to their loved ones? And I really believe maybe even a more contemporary example here would be when we look at some of the changes in legislations or policy, we see that the rates of addiction also change. I think a very recent example would be when they first introduced the smoking ban in England, which was 10 years ago. And when they looked at the smoking rates 10 years ago and now, it's reduced by 2 million. So 2 million pe people in England 
quit smoking since the smoking ban. So this again shows us that if something changes in the environment, it might as well make us uh, go for different type of choices. Another argument of the disease model is that the brain of the addict is basically malfunctioning. Why? Because it turns into something else. We see certain changes in the brain. That has been their main argument. But then when we look at the concept of neuroplasticity, we know that it's not only the brain of the addicts, but also the brains of musicians, sportsmen, or even as research shows us, taxi drivers in London show structural changes in their brain. Lots of research shows that frequent, consistent uh, musical practice actually leads to structural and functional changes of the brain. Similarly, taxi drivers in London, they need to go through a very difficult uh, examination to get their taxi driver license. And in part of the training, they need to learn about 25,000 streets in London plus thousands of landmarks. So while they are studying to pass for the exam, their brain actually, again, similarly shows structural changes. So we know that these changes, as I said, doesn't only happen as a result of alcohol or heroin, but any other type of skill similarly changes the brain. And maybe we should also realize that still here we are not only talking about the skills, but we know, psychologists know that sometimes certain types of cognitions, certain types of thoughts also change the brain. Such as if you look at the brain of someone who is depressive, it's going to look quite different to someone who is not depressive. So basically the argument here would be, yes, there are changes in the brain in the case of addiction, but that doesn't necessarily imply that it's a malfunctioning or diseased brain. And when we look at, so what does the disease model offer to us then in terms of treatment? If they think addiction is a disease, and obviously they think this is partly due to the disease brain, then obviously the type of treatment oops, that they would uh, provide would be one that is medical, biological. But when we look at the argument that maybe this is not a disease, but it's a choice, it's just the wrong choice that we are making, then possibly we can start to look beyond that. Maybe the treatment can be biomedical, but that should maybe be only supplementary, not biomedical just by itself. When we think about it, and again, this is something that we know very clearly, those people who are more likely to become addicted to something usually lack certain skills. They perceive less support. They have less self-regulation skills. They have less motivation to change. They have less empathy. And all of these are psychological or social factors. They are not medical, biological factors. When we look at how medicines work in any type of disease, including addiction, we know that at the lower levels, yes, medication does work by altering certain neurotransmitters, in this case, dopamine. If we look at what happens at the middle level, similarly, we see that medication might actually help by uh, reducing our desires. But do medications help what we call at the highest level, which is all about self-control and motivation? No, they don't. This is why any type of addiction treatment should not be only composed of some biological or medical treatment. But when we look at the treatment of addiction, it should include change in also social skills, as I said previously, coping skills, assertiveness skills, self-regulation skills, but similarly provide people with more social support, provide people, encourage them to be more motivated for change. Even when we look at the relapse rates, we know that some people who become addicted, especially to certain substances, they keep relapsing back and back. So they find it very difficult to quit drinking or smoking or you know, whatever other substance it might be. But again, are they relapsing because they have been sick, because they had a disease? My argument would be no. When we look at the sample of addicts, usually these people are people who also have other problems, maybe depression, maybe anxiety, maybe they have experienced traumas. So if you don't teach these people how to regulate their own emotions, how to cope with the stressors of life, 
how to be more assertive, then of course they're going to relapse. So the reason they are relapsing back and back, then they end up in this cycle, addiction cycle, is not necessarily because it's a, it's a disease that they are sick, but it's really because they need to get certain skills. And I think here another example might be, you know, if you think of a heavy smoker, or we might also think of, you know, a heavy drinker here. And let's say this person needed to seek medical treatment, medical opinion. When they go to the hospital, let's, in the case of a heavy smoker, assume that the surgeon tells this person, basically, if you keep smoking, you're going to die because your lungs are so damaged that this is going to kill you. We see many times that people decide, choose to stop smoking at that moment. So again, if this was a disease, people would not be able to quit that moment. And that person is not quitting at that moment because they have received any type of medical treatment. But usually, why do people decide to stop drinking or smoking when they have been given such a, such a kind of awful news is because they are frightened Maybe they wanted to spend more time with their family. <coughs> and I think maybe again, one of the most fundamentals, uh, fundamental arguments of the disease model of addiction is that, you know, once you're an addict, you will always be an addict. When I started doing my PhD in the field of addiction, this was also slightly my point of view, you know, I guess I was quite prejudiced, and I thought that, you know, if someone is an addict, they are destined to be an addict all their life. But then when I started teaching a postgraduate course, which only included as students, which only accepted students who were ex-addicts, it changed my whole point of view. These students of mine were ex-heroin addicts, ex-alcoholics, ex-sex addicts, of whom some of them used to live on the street. But now, they were sitting in front of me, taking courses from me, and at the end of their degree, they would actually become addiction counselors. So it really made me realize that these people, they were not sick, they didn't have a disease. The reason that they were an alcoholic or you know, a heroin addict was purely because of what was going on in their life. So once they were able to get the sufficient amount of psychological support and they were able to train in certain skills, then they were able also to make a new life for themselves. So this really changed my point on this argument. And I definitely do not believe anymore that once you're an addict, you will always be an addict. So I guess I'm going to conclude with, you know, uh, one maybe question to you. So, as I've been hopefully trying to say, you know, addicts do make a choice. This is a wrong choice, no doubt in that. But still, it's a choice that they're making. And what makes me sometimes think, what makes me think actually quite a lot is, don't we all sometimes make wrong choices? Sometimes we all kind of try to, you know, live a healthier life. We make promises to ourselves. We keep having really good intentions to change for a better life. We keep telling ourselves, I am going to exercise more. I am going to eat more healthily. I am going to socialize more with my friends. I am going to study more for my exams. But do we all end up doing what we, you know, hoped for? No. We all lack willpower from time to time. So I really think that, you know, we should be more humane when we look at the field of addiction. So maybe addicts are actually not that different to us. Maybe, you know, this is a quite similar scenario for all of us, but maybe it's just slightly, you know, perceived differently in their case, because we might lack willpower, so do they. But of course, you know, maybe we end up blaming it for them. But no one blames us when we decide that we are going to start exercising, but we don't. So that's why I really would like to conclude by saying that I strongly believe that this uh, very strong argument of the supporters of the disease model, who basically say that disease model is really, truly the only way to prevent blaming or punishing addicts, 
or to remove the stigma around them and accept them as society. I really believe this is flawed. I don't think that is right. So therefore, I believe that if we start looking at it from a more humanistic point of view, if we start to focus on the strengths of addicts, but not only view them with their deficiencies, Hopefully, you know, maybe we can also persuade the public, the society, uh, that this is not necessarily a disease. Maybe this is just a difficult phase people are going through. But if we provide them with certain help, they can maybe overcome this problem of theirs. Thank you.